Welcome to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast, hosted by Peter O'Toole, sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. Today on The Microscopists... Hello, today on The Microscopist, I'm joined by Emma Lundberg from Stanford and from KTH Royal Institute of Technology and the head of the subcellular section of the Human Protein Atlas. And today, we talk about the image analysis community. It's a really nice collaborative field and it's really amazing to work in it and everyone is building off of each other's solutions and not competing with each other. We discuss staying positive in difficult times. Even though it's been tough times, we've been able to really come together and do it as a team because of course we have tough crunch times every year in front of every release, but we can make it a fun team effort at least. And we hear about how she became an avatar in a citizen science video game. And then one evening I get an email saying like, by the way, Emma, um, da, 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 da. and can we also, is it okay with you that we put this avatar in, in the game? All in this episode of The Microscopists. Hi, I'm Peter O'Toole and welcome to this episode of The Microscopists. Today I'm joined by Emma Lundberg from Stanford and, and KTH Royal Institute of Technology. Emma, how are you today? I'm doing great, thank you. Thanks for talking to me. I'm going to say the, the first bit is quite a mouthful, Stanford and KTH Royal Institute of Technology, which suggests you've got two labs. How does that I work? Do. I do. At the moment, I do. So I've been in Sweden uh, for, I got my PhD at, at KDH, and I've been there working with the Human Protein Atlas ever since, and a full professor there. And then I spent a couple of years at Stanford, uh, 2017, 18, and 19 at Stanford as a visiting professor. And after, I would say in the middle of the pandemic, we decided that we were actually going to go back to the US, and I accepted a, a position, a tenured position at Stanford. And right now I'm I have one leg in each country and my lab is halfway here. I'm building the lab at Stanford, which is fun and exciting. Right now, only the computational part is here and the wet lab is in Sweden. So I'm a, a master of juggling time zones at the moment and the master of early morning Zoom meetings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that I can imagine. I, and I, 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 also, I asked you actually at the start, before we started, any question I cannot ask you, I've got to ask you this, because you look insanely young and you have a professorship and you've got a position at Stanford. How old are you? I'm 41. Okay, you don't look 41, but that's still amazing <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> to have got to, to what, a, what a stellar career so far. Uh, Thank you. I, I usually ask people, you know, what they wish they'd done and you're only you're not even halfway through your career yet. Uh, to actually, uh, we'll come back to the split labs. I, I'm going to yep. go back, being as you know, you're on this stellar trajectory. When you were ten, what did you want to be? A pilot. <laughs> A pilot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> scientist was not on my radar whatsoever. Was this a long haul pilot? A short haul pilot? Anything pilot. I think it was fun fun flying uh that that i i i had lots of different ideas i, I never had this like one dream i want to become this one thing for me it's always been I, i've had many different jobs let's say summer jobs growing up and things like that and it, it always ended up with if i liked it it was because of the people that i worked with so i, I can actually you know in retrospect think that i could have had many different careers and and could have chosen many different career paths uh, and I would have probably loved it if I liked the people that I work with. As long as I find it stimulating somehow, and and you know, I, I like the team science as well, so it's important to me. So how to okay, so from being wanting to be a pilot, you when did you start to get when did you start to get interested in science and knew you, you wanted to go in that direction? Yeah, I was always interested in in I guess the human body, science, medicine, things like that, and I was thinking of maybe going into the MD kind of trajectory, but I didn't really have the grades for it, to be honest. So then I was like, ah, do I want to try to up my grades and get into med school? Or no, I'll just, you know, study biotechnology. It's close enough. It's interesting with drugs and drug development. Let's let's do that. And then I decided to do that. Or actually, I started out chemistry and then I I swapped to, to bioengineering. After so one is year. that at degree level you swapped? It was actually after one year, so it was at, at for one year into the bachelor. So, 
Well, I've got to ask, why did you why did you leave the ship of chemistry? Uh, I just found bioengineering so much more fun. Engineering proteins and everything you can do with the human body. It was just much more appealing to me and much more fun. So I'm looking at your research that you've got. It's very sort of obviously you've got the AI side, the computational side, but you've got the wet lab side, which is, I would argue, quite biochemistry driven in some respects. So has a chemistry, do you think actually having that chemistry founding really helps on that side? I don't think it really helped on that side, to be honest. For me, it was was too early on. And then I actually, my PhD, I did on small recombinant binders. So developing small recombinant binders for different uh, proteins. So that was more on the kind of protein engineering side. But what I do think has helped me a lot is the the kind of engineering perspective. I like to automate things and scale things up and, and do that, which has been very helpful in the Human Protein Atlas project. <clears throat> so I like I like pipetting robots and you know <laughs> things for, like that. For those listening, what is the human protein atlas or the cell atlas? Yes, the, the human protein atlas is a, a large project and a database that you can find at proteinatlas.org. Uh, it's one of the largest biological databases. I think we have one and a half million users worldwide per year. And what we do there is that we present, this project was started by Professor Matthias Ulan uh, after the genome project was finished, I would say. And the aim of this project was to understand where the proteins that our genes encode for are located in our body, in, in the tissue level and also at the subcellular level. So at when I got my PhD, I was recruited to set up the subcellular at, part of this project or the cell atlas where we map where in our cells the proteins are localized if they're in the mitochondria or in the nucleus to gain clues about their function so this has been a very 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 large scale project it's been running for nearly two decades and it's involved many people in sweden and all over the world so it, it's been a very fun ride it still is you know i, I think i can appreciate I, I, how many proteins have you so far localized if that's a, a right term to use for it. Yes, that's that's all a matter of, uh, of definition. We've generated antibodies for almost all human proteins, and we've tested all of those antibodies. We haven't approved all of them. How many is that? Uh, so we have about, currently the, the estimate is that we have about 20,000 protein coding genes in the human genome. It's almost exactly that. And we have probably 19, 000, antibodies for over 19,000 of these proteins. And then in the, the tissue atlas of the, the protein atlas, we've mapped nearly 18,000 proteins. And in the cell atlas, we're at 14,000. So, and this is more a matter of, it's not a limitation of the antibodies, but it's a limitation of what proteins are actually expressed in the material that we're studying. So in, a, in, in an average cell line, you don't find more than maybe 12,000 proteins expressed. So, I, and cell I, lines are pretty similar. So we don't find all proteins that are expressed only at developmental stages, for example. It's also hard to capture secreted proteins, of course, inside of cells. The one thing is sequence in the human genome, <clears throat> and that's pretty linear. But when you're fishing in different cells for different proteins and trying to look at the localization and making sure the antibody works, because it might not necessarily work, so that might give a false negative, you might get cross-reaction or false positives. <clears throat> and 18,000, you sent me some images and probably not for this reason, but you sent me one of your fluorescent. Yes, wow. the okay. heart, the nuclear heart. That is just an image. This is a, a fluorescent image of a cell. The nucleus, the blue is the DNA and it forms a heart here. The green is actin filaments and red is mitochondria. And this image I just sent you because that was what appealed me to, to go into this area with microscopy because I, I just think it's beautiful and sometimes you know, in, in this case, I do know what the markers are and they are specific, but sometimes the antibody might be unspecific, but the image is still beautiful, right? So I, I just find it, I, I like it to work with, with visually, you know, attractive media, <laughs> so to say. Yeah, I'm in the middle of two hearts now, so I'm probably breaking this heart, which is not a good thing to be doing. <laughs> I, I think what's really fascinating, you've got three colors here. So you've got the nucleus, you've got the mitochondria, you've got the cytoskeleton. So you've got those labeled. When you're trying to identify your target, you're going to have to have another antibody added to these to correlate which organelle, which part of the cell it is in. So that's one antibody per experiment? 
one antibody per experiment. So three reference markers, one antibody. So you can do the math. If we want to map 20,000 proteins in a variety of different, different cell lines, that's a lot of samples to prepare. And, and how that's long, why we need automation. And how long would it take to acquire an image like this? With it all optimized to get the laser powers right, the sensitivity yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. An image like this takes... No, less than a minute or a minute or something. We do high resolution line scanning confocal imaging and to get the highest possible subcellular resolution at a decent, uh, I would say, decent time. So, but you can kind of position us somewhere. It's not high content imaging where you have, for example, do drug screening and you add lots of drugs and you, you image with exactly the same parameters and you just feed plates into the microscopes. That's not what we're doing. Uh, and we do want high resolution, but we're not, we don't want to do one sample one at a time manually either. So we're somewhere in between there, right? And for a long time, the, the bottlenecks have moved over the years, right? You automate one step and the bottleneck is somewhere else. And then you automate that and the bottleneck is somewhere else. But reasonably preparing more than, if we do it in multi-well plates, preparing more than a couple of multi-well plates a day wouldn't make sense uh, because... We, we don't need a higher throughput than that. So preparing, let's say, 500 immunostain samples a week, that's quite high capacity. And that means that we can image one plate, for example, overnight. And that's fine in terms of throughput. So we never had to push the imaging further than that. I, it, 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 is a crazy, it is a crazy amount, especially when you think about the, the false leads and the, the, the errors and removing all of that. And this is this is moving. So I'm going to come back to some of these bits in a bit. But you just described the, the size, the number of images you're acquiring. <clears throat> the, the data size that you're getting off this is also going to be really big. I presume you haven't got someone looking at every image, but you're going to probably then have some sort of image analysis to help assist with this. So how, yeah. how have you approached that? Yes. So over the years, we have, I have looked at very many of the images in the protein atlas. I tell you, sometimes you can almost, you should have had a quiz. You could have showed me an image and I could have guessed which protein it is. Uh, but no, in the beginning, we started out annotating all images manually. I think that's also good for really internalizing the quality and, and the different quality approval steps that you have to, to build into your pipeline. And we did that for a long time. And the problem for automating the classification of these patterns has been that we have so let me just revert to the problem right and why we've automated yeah. minimized it in different ways so the problem is we, we have an image of a cell with these three reference markers and then we have a protein of interest and that protein can be in the nucleus in the cytosol mitochondria all together right now we're classifying around 34 different structures or substructures of the cell but that's not it because we have also shown and this was not very known before we showed that uh, in a paper in 2017, that half of all human proteins actually localized to multiple compartments in the cell at the same time, which is very interesting from a functional perspective. But sticking to the, the technical aspects, this means that a classifier needs to be able to classify mixed patterns. And it might be so that 10% of the protein is in the mitochondria and 90% in the cytosol or vice versa. So this makes that the image classification problem much more tricky. And the second thing is that we work with many, many different cell lines. Uh, I think we have 60 cell lines represented in the cell atlas today, and they look morphologically different. And for example, a Golgi apparatus will look slightly different in these different cell lines. So it, sh it sh needs to be a very generalizable model to be robust. So for a long time, we just realized that we won't be able to do it. So we have a very nice internally developed limb system where we can annotate images blindly, and we have different layers of people doing it. So we've all the proteins in the protein atlas today have been manually assessed, both in terms of, of the label and in terms of the, the quality and in relation to literature. So that's a lot of work. And that's why we call actually the protein atlas a knowledge base and maybe not just a database because it is curated data. Uh, but then over the years, we've worked to, because now we can generate more data faster. <laughs> so we, we really need to scale the image annotations as well. So one at first, we thought, let's just crowdsource this. People are very good at recognizing patterns. Even kids can generalize very well. This is an image of a cat. This is a real cat. This is a drawn cat, for example. So maybe we can use the general public to help us annotate these images. And for that, we did a citizen science project. However, that citizen science project was great fun, very successful, but not scalable still, because we don't want to pass our images through a game all the time. 
uh, when we want it annotated. So it, we've also it worked it with... Game. So it wasn't just pictures on there and people engaging it. So you actually gamified. Is that the right gamification? It's not quite the right, but you made a game to yeah. get engaged in citizen science. Yes, yeah, so inspired by Sold It and these previous amazing games where they gamified a scientific task. Uh, the idea behind this game, I should say that this is, was a collaboration with Attila Sentner at the company called MMOS that is still running today, producing beautiful citizen science projects. And uh, the idea here was to make use of, of the general public and, and build a game, but the hard work with a game is really to get people to start to play it. Even if you look at commercial mobile games today, they will usually pay people to start to play it. For example, that's how you get get traction. So the idea that we had was that instead of building a standalone game, if we inject the scientific task into an existing game with a big player base, then maybe we can do citizen science in a very efficient way. So, so this is part of the marketing. This, this is you in the game. This is Professor Lundberg in the game. I could not control her in the game. So it, it, she was a uh, uh, non-player character in there. And uh, it's, it's actually kind of a fun story because I've never, we were working. So my team and Attila's team in Switzerland and uh, the producers of this game called EVE Online, um, the producers, the, the company is called CCP Games on, on Iceland in Reykjavik. And they were we were working together, having weekly meetings on this game and designing different aspects of it. It was a really fun interdisciplinary project. And then one evening, I get an email saying, like, by the way, Emma, um, da, 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 da. and can we also? Is it okay with you that we put this avatar in in the game? And they had it wasn't this image; it was another one when I was wearing a very tight lab coat, and I never met these people. <laughs> So she just Google Googled me, stalked me on images everywhere, and she made this pretty realistic, uh, but of course, gamified version of me. And I was terrified, and I, my instant reaction was, no, no, no way, I'm going to do that. That's just, you know, too much. Um, and then my husband told me, he's like, oh, but you're always talking about women in science and being a role model, and now you get the chance of of having a female cool avatar in a game that mainly has main has, has like a million male players and you're gonna say no to that you you can never even, ever talk about this problem again if you say no to this <laughs> and i i kind of saw his point there and it it, it was a fun fun well, thing to do you sent me the picture so you must be proud of it it's a very good avatar uh, yeah not, that avatar is great <laughs> not in a scientific lab coat but in a space age robot -y type bulletproof a combat combat suit yeah thank you. combat type base combat suit i think <laughs> so uh, it is worth if you are listening just going to grab a picture and actually i'll ask after if we get a picture up but maybe on the the tweets and stuff as well because it is it's a very cool avatar to, to have your it's own nice. avatar. she has freckles yeah. even like i really? do yeah if you look uh, closely you can see the freckles uh, now i've got to go back it's uh, it's, it's that's really cool, isn't it? I, uh, right, I want an avatar. I've been <laughs> out. Yeah. <laughs> and in the game life. after me, there was actually a Nobel laureate that was the avatar. And they were discovering Exoplanet in this game. Oh. So the platform has been reused for other games later. So that's also fun. What's the game called? The game is called Project Discovery within, within the virtual universe of the science fiction game EVE Online. So the scientific mini game that we developed is, yeah. is Project Discovery. So, so it's very different because uh, I don't know how well you know Lucy Collinson and her citizen science project, which is very much signing up to draw around objects. And it, it, it is, if you listen to Lucy's podcast, she, if you listeners, it, it's really good to hear how she's engaged. This is a very different way of engaging citizen science. Yes, uh, it how is. A sanity check to check that what they're doing is correct. And the result yes. Yeah, so th there's lots of funny stories about this, and and there's lots of things that we we spent. The game was running for one year, and during one year we had I think three hundred thousand, three hundred twenty thousand gamers that provided thirty two million image classifications. So it's really wow. remarkable. Uh, and, and if you look at the time they spent on the mi the the mini game, uh, they spent seventy working years in the mini game classifying images for us. So you can imagine that it's it's great help. But then Seven we zero. spent about a year to analyze the data to make sure, like, because the the big we were being questioned by the scientific community. Can you really ask 
your average gamer to help you classify images and build science upon that. And we were, we were convinced that we could, but of course we had to show it. So in the game that the players had to go through a training, a tutorial and then a training before they could classify real images. But then it's all a matter of incentive. I would say that you have to balance. So one incentive that is like actually turned out to be important is the greater good contributing to something that is greater good. We got a lot of comments if we were, you know, reading Reddit and other, other forums that people were very, they knew that the results of this project would feed into the Human Protein Atlas, that it's open source, open access to everyone. You can use it for commercial use or non-commercial use. So that, that gave people a motivation to contribute to it. Uh, but then also there were also in-game rewards and other motivations so that you could benefit in the game by helping out with these tasks. But there we had a little fun thing that we wanted to try because gamers are always going to try to game the game, right? Uh, so we thought, what, how are we going to reward them? So either we reward them on how well they agree with the community, right? Yeah. But, but surely they're going to game that and they're going to agree on something and 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 just get yeah. high rewards. But let's try it. But we prepared in the background, we had prepared a, a set of control images, otherwise that we would randomly insert and only reward them on their performance on the control images where we had the answer, basically, because they were annotating locations de novo that we hadn't annotated in the Protein Atlas. And did they know that they existed? So they knew they had to perform well? No, they knew they knew that they had to, no, they, in the beginning we launched it so that you, if you agree with the you know consensus, you get reward, or, or I don't think we even said that, but they figured it out. It took a week. After seven days, we started seeing memes like spam the cytoplasm and everyone just click cytoplasm and we could see that they all did and the yeah. accuracy dropped <laughs> on the control images yeah, but then we were win score yeah yeah so we were just thinking this is just fun to see how quickly they game it and then we swapped and added these um, control images and then instantly they started performing because they didn't know which images were controls they could see it after okay this was just a control this is what i'm ranked at and, and then immediately they started playing uh, well again. Have you played it yourself? I Of course, I've played it a lot while we developed it. I didn't want to play it since I'm one of the experts and I contribute to the expert annotations that we were comparing with. So I didn't want to yeah. confound it. And we were quite busy answering forums and being of support in the game. So, so you said your husband said you, you had to have your own avatar. What do your children think of it? By then they were a bit too young. I, I think they're, they don't really care, to be honest. I don't know. They think it's cool. My younger one said, yeah, mom is famous, but she doesn't really know what and in what, what game. It's not in the games she's playing. So uh, yeah, they're, they're, I'm just their mom. They don't really care. <laughs> Three, was it 320,000, did you say? Yeah. Oh, that's a huge, huge number. So to, you sent me a picture of your short your family as well. Yeah, this is my family family a couple of years back. That's my husband in the green pants, my dad in the blue pants, and then it's my two daughters. Uh, they are nine and ten now, Ingrid and Edith. So this was and a few this, years ago. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This was a few years ago, and this photo is taken at my favorite place on this earth, which is a place in the north of Sweden called the Riksgränsen, when I, where I spent a lot of time skiing when I was young and we also ski there quite a lot now at the cabin and it's a beautiful place because it's you know midnight sun in the summers and in the winters it doesn't get bright but you can ski in May with the sun up in the middle of the night so it's beautiful. So is, is skiing your favorite relaxation? Yes anything uh, skiing snowboarding I love that's my favorite thing to do i I'm trying to learn. Uh, it's very fun, but I'm not quite good at it yet. So mountain biking is my new thing. Since I moved to California, I figured I have to have something more uh, sun friendly. <laughs> I, I, that, that is what I was going to ask you next, because obviously they moved to Stanford. <laughs> the, the skiing opportunities are not quite so grand, certainly in the summer, <laughs> certainly not possible. No, but it's it's not that far to go to Lake Tahoe. Yeah. To ski in the winter so we do get a lot of skiing and we have season passes here as well so how how, how have you found moving uh it's just quite a big move to move the family over i guess they're young but how challenging was it to move across yeah and, and now we've done it twice right we did it for this 
sabbatical and that was very easy we packed up a couple of bags and this is gonna last for a year and we're doing this and it's an adventure it's a year that was I would say pretty easy of course you still have to understand you know get a new phone get an electricity you know set up everything that for life but that was pretty fine and then this time when we moved more long term it was a different thing because we packed up the house and shipped our things and of course, we know the area, the kids know their friends at school, I know Stanford. So in one way, it felt easier, but it was also emotionally a bigger move, I think. So yeah, but no, no, there, it's it's just a lot of work and moving. I would say it's, it's super fun. And I think you grow as a person and you learn a lot. Stanford is an amazingly inspiring environment. And I love this kind of entrepreneurial ecosystem that exists here. I think it's stimulating and and so so it's a great place to be uh, but but it, it takes time to move and it takes time to settle in and moving during the pandemic surely didn't make it easier <laughs> it no, took us it took us six months from when our container shipped until we could unpack it so we basically lived without furniture for six months <laughs> got deck chairs and yeah yeah. some deck chairs and mattresses on the floor and some we have very nice neighbors and friends here so of course we borrowed the things that we needed but yeah so it was fun for a while camping out in your own house but it was very good to get our stuff in the end as well what are you missing I, I, you know you moved over what do you miss most from sweden my family and friends absolutely I mean, you, you develop new friends obviously yeah 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 family family old-time friends and also certain types of food and <laughs> and I think the the four right now we're just enjoying the summer weather here I think think at some point we'll miss having four seasons yeah no I, th th there's a lot to be said for seasons yeah yeah and that change and seem to look forward to the ever-changing gr greenery or lack of greenery <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> goes through no I, I yeah I can see that and it, but will you miss the dark days? No, or well, maybe it's kind of cozy also. I don't know. I never really, since I grew up in the north of Sweden, that the winters are darker and the summers are very bright. I, I'm not really bothered by the darkness. So I, I don't know. I'm, yeah. Yeah, I to my I, I'm not sure. I don't know. I'll get, I have to get back to you on if I miss it or not. But uh, it, it was not the thing that made me move <laughs> away from yeah, no, no, obviously. Uh, my microscopist, we live in the dark anyway, don't we? Exactly. <laughs> go to work in the dark, go into a dark lab, come back in the dark. And it's, yes. <laughs> it's just, just something that we actually do. I'm going to change subjects a little bit. What was your first microscope that you can remember professionally using? Uh, not professionally. Well, it was it was actually a, an old size microscope, but I, I, that's not the one I want to talk about. I want to talk about the first that I bought for setting mm -hmm. up the human protein atlas, because that's, I think, more ma made a more significant uh, yeah. memory for me. So when when I was after my PhD, going to set up this um, cell atlas of the human protein atlas, of course, I had we had to think about automation. And at that point, a line scanning of focal microscope, the problem is that we don't know what the expression level of every protein is, and we don't know the locations. So we need to be able to really adapt the dynamic range, and we want high resolution with no automated microscopes that could do this at this time point. And the companies try to sell us high content screeners or try to sell us different things. And, and then I, I made the executive decision to actually order a regular confocal microscope that we could automate um, ourselves, but flip it and make it upright so that we just steal the plates, flip them, could add oil on top and then automate it. And, you know, the, the sales representatives are at like, are like, are you sure you're going to order two of those? Really? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and, and in retrospect, they told me like, it was actually a really good discussion decision and you managed to build a a solid pipeline based on that decision but it was it was uh, I, it was questioned quite a lot in the beginning <laughs> so, so that, that decision I'm very happy with because thanks to that we were able to actually do overnight runs with oil immersion microscopy and, and do generate the data at this scale um, so it, it, it wasn't the fanciest microscope or anything it was a workhorse that we flipped the right way for us and of course these are fixed and permeabilized cells so, so yeah. they could be yeah, exactly. I, I, we just I, I, had to sacrifice because in order to seal them properly, we needed to use a metal foil. So we had to sacrifice the bright field. But 
So uh, you, you sent me another that, fluorescent image. Yeah, yeah. That, this is something that we're quite interested. My lab is looking a lot at now when we've mapped where the proteins are in the different locations. But we also, so we've shown that half of all proteins can be found in multiple places and have multiple functions. But then we often see images like this. So these cells are, you know, genetically identical cells, but obviously they don't look the same. We can see that some cells are brighter and some are dimmer. And here you can also see that sometimes the protein is in the nucleus, sometimes it's in the cytosol, sometimes it's on the plasma membrane. So it, it seems to be a lot of spatiotemporal dynamics going on here, which is super interesting. So we've been able to map that 20% of all proteins show signs of spatiotemporal dynamics. And at first we thought that it would all map to the cell cycle. Uh, well, it didn't. One third we can explain by the cell cycle, but we found many new cell cycle proteins that are uh, stable at the RNA level, but regulated at the post-transcriptional post level. But then we also find a lot of metabolic enzymes that behave like this. And I think that is super fascinating. Why are, why are we seeing so much spatiotemporal dynamics of metabolic enzymes? The function in the nucleus is often unknown. This example is enolase 1. So here we know that it performs three completely different functions in the nucleus, plasma membrane, and, and cytosol. But it's one of the few examples where we actually have this knowledge. So right now, the lab is thinking a lot about how can we build, fun, fun, how can we do functional screenings to assess functions of proteins in given locations and not just knock this gene out and assess the function. So if it's not cell cycle, is it apopty ap apoptosis related? Nope. It's cells that seem to be moving in and out of metabolic states, for example, or other processes. Maybe there's other oscillatory processes happening that we don't know of, or maybe it's it's certain properties being optimized at a population level and not at a cell level so that you should have some kind of buffering effects for perturbations if your population has different capacities. So it's it's just a lot of unknowns, but it, it's a very fascinating, it's, it's a lot of fascinating questions. And it's, a, in my opinion, I think it's a strong argument for why if we want to model cells and predict cell behavior, I think we need spatial information to do that because how can we otherwise capture these uh, changes in, in function, probably, depending on where the protein is. We'll talk after. I, ha I have a just a thought, but I won't do that on doing the podcast. We'll get too geeky. Uh, <laughs> so we'll come back to that afterwards. Because have you, who's been uh, your inspirations throughout your career? Oh, that's a tough one. I would have wanted to prepare for that question. Uh, I've had many different people as inspirations during my career. I think different aspects, you know, some people are, give great uh, talks and I admire them when I listen to their talks and other people are good leaders and, you know, scientists and some people are just amazing team players. So I think I've had, I, I can list a lot of people, so I prefer not to mention one here. Because <laughs> yeah, you'll leave some out. No, that, that's yeah, fair. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> what would you say has been the most challenging time? In your career to date? Oh, I'm an optimist. I forget them. <laughs> but <laughs> the pandemic, of course, was challenging, I think, for a lot of people uh, to try to work from home and, and uh, you know, keep a distance and, and just cope with that. How big was your lab Besides, at that point? My lab is, it depends a bit on how you count it, because it's also, yeah. uh, I would say, around 15 to 18 people in my lab. And then there's a uh, associated core facility that are about five people as well that we work very, very closely with. But I, I think that most challenging time, I think for me uh, personally, a challenging time was after we released the like, big cell atlas in 2016 and the science publication in 2017, I was struggling a bit with, so what do I do now, right? It's now I, I had been working on that for so long, for a decade. So what do I do now? And I, I didn't go abroad for a postdoc. And, and that's when I started to think about the sabbatical and everything. So at that time, I had a little, oh, should I go to industry? Or maybe I should do something completely different. But at, at that time, it had been a bit too much of the same for me. But I think in general, we have a, we've had a very nice team and we do science in a team way. So most often, it, even though it's been tough times, we've been able to really come together and do it as a team. Because of course, we have tough crunch times every year in front of every release, but we can make it a fun team effort at least. So no real bad times. Okay, what's been the biggest highlight of your career? Oh, 
the biggest highlight I think it is some like the release of the cell atlas was a great highlight and you know I, I don't know I'm a people person highlights are when people get their you know defend their PhD theses or things like that are always always amazing so <laughs> I'm just thinking you you found yourself floundering well I'm not saying floundering you found yourself so you, you, you released a cell atlas you didn't await maybe what the next big project was it was going to have such a big impact how big a distraction was it because once that was released you were going to be hugely popular on the conference scene for plenary lectures everywhere across the world yes <clears throat> how crazy a time was that um it was a bit crazy but down. i also i i like it <laughs> so i think those uh it was a very good time to do that to really get mm -hmm. to to go to a lot of different conferences, to give lectures and, and listen to lectures there and think about, so what's the next step? What's the next frontier? Where do we want to push this, right? Because we have this rich resource of images that we can mine in ways that we couldn't before, right? And, and maybe we can ask quest answer questions that other people aren't even asking. So trying to figure out, like, because there's so many interesting findings that we have in this set of images and trying to figure out like where what direction do we actually go for right and, and right now it's been towards that single cell towards the goal of providing a spatiotemporal model of the entire podium in a human cell so i don't think i'm going to get an answer to the next question though of all the conferences you go to been to what is your favorite conference <laughs> i can give you a question uh, i I mean, there's a lot to it. Where, where is the meeting? What part of the world? Who else is there? So I, I can probably pick many favorites, but one that it's not my favorite scientific conference for sure, but it, it's different was at a fan fest meeting in Las Vegas for this game. Um, and I was giving a, a plenary lecture there and I, I don't know how many thousand people there were in the audience and there were like 10,000 people on Twitch. And um, that was a very interesting experience because it's not like a polite quiet, uh, scientific audience people were booing and cheering during the talk and it was it was just a very different experience and it was so much fun and uh, the the vibe was very different and you of course we, standing on a stage cheering. talking about cell biology to a room of a couple of thousand gamers that was a bizarre experience experience <laughs> but did you say they were booing as well as cheering yeah, yeah, because they were competing different teams and, and and they were booing about certain things. Spam the side of class, boo, why did you remove that? And I don't remember the exact things, but it, it struck me as very, it was a very different experience and it, it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, do you have to do autographs afterwards? No, I, I, I do not have to do autographs. I have been recognized, I think, once on the street as Professor Lundberg from the game, though. So that was, I was actually very... <laughs> We're very honoured by that. You weren't wearing a black combat suit, were you? No, <laughs> just, no just a... not, not a lab coat either. So, yeah. But it was fun. We actually had a very, it was also fun. We made for one of the, another, the next year's big game event, the Fan Fest, we developed a little mini game where you can, could compete against each other on, on classifying images. And then we had like, you could qualify and had semifinals and then a final. It was so much fun. <laughs> That was actually, it's like citizen science as an e-sport or something. It was it was really fun. And the winner got a, a human protein atlas lab coat and he was wearing it all night. Uh, it, it was great. <laughs> it sounds like really good fun. I, I, normal conference is a good fun, but that sounds very, yeah. very we, different. We could learn something from that, I think, in terms of the, the atmosphere. Maybe not booing, but, you know, a little bit more interaction during the talks could be nice. <clears throat> nice. Just, just encourage it just, just tell them to yeah <laughs> give that story a start and see what happens scientists are quite serious though sometimes aren't they yeah exactly so they, yeah we, we all have to help out to make that happen I think yeah I think there's a lot of guarded behavior in the scientific community and it's not quite so easy trust me we've had conferences where you can get the audience really going yeah yeah maybe that, that's a good idea I'll think of that and maybe I'll give it a try at some point you know, when you go to a conference and you get two parallel sessions, if you're next door to another parallel session with a competing field, all you have to do is say, at the end, I want the loudest applause. I want whistles. I want groups. And generally, the audience will do it. 
And the best thing is if you know the chairs of the competing session, I've done this once and they've come out and gone, good grief, your session must have been amazing. The applause, the, the cheers at the end was just unbelievable. <laughs> no idea, we just set everyone up to do it just to make them feel inferior <laughs> to our session. Sounds just, fun. <laughs> it can be encouraged. <laughs> uh, I have some quick fire questions, but I won't go to those, but I will ask one question while we're talking about conferences. If you were to, when you get invited, usually you get taken out for dinner at some point, and sometimes you don't get a choice of what you're eating. Uh, you'll get taken somewhere very swish and food is served in front of you. What is your nightmare food to have put in front of you? Well, that would be some kind of, I don't know, worms or insects or, or anything like that. I have, I, I, I can eat most, um, you know, I, I'll eat most food except what I'm allergic to. And, but that I have a hard time with. Mm. I'll probably eat it because I'm very polite, but I, I would struggle. And what about, what would be the, the best thing that they could put in front of you? What is your favorite food? The best thing would be some kind of um, modern take on, on vegan food, actually, or vegetarian food. So we're really trying to become more sustainable and eating more um, vegetarian food. But it's, vegan cooking is hard, I think. So some inspiration there would be nice. <clears throat> okay so so, so, that so we're be... not doing a lot of vegan cooking but the, the, we have aspirations at least <laughs> yeah no, no. i'd say it's not it's, it don't, don't have to be all in to make an impact uh, no you know it, it was quite good to us talking to stefan turjung uh Turing recently on this and yeah he's 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 certainly very big at the moment in minimizing his impact which involved going to less conferences in his case <clears throat> that's a hard one to give up because that's your network, your influence, uh, spreading the word as well. It's quite yeah. challenging. Yeah, but I think you have, we've, we've now learned how to do virtual meetings also. And maybe I think it's it's our responsibility to choose which meetings we go to carefully and not travel as much and maybe make more out of the travels when we do travel and travel by train and other means as well. Uh, hard in the US but Europe uh, works works well there so I, I think it's uh, like the climate change is a more important matter and more urgent matter. So changing tack we talked about in fact I have one more image because this will dovetail nicely with it I hope. Ah oh, I am looking for an image that's completely gone off my screen. You sent me a picture of a duodenum that has vanished. Ah I don't you want me to, you want me to show there. it? Yes, please. Let me see. I think I have it here. Oh, I can't share my screen. Sorry. Ah, it's okay. It's okay. <clears throat> so all the images, all that data rich part, and you created the online game and so forth. <laughs> uh, I would say you to so your bioengineering, biochemistry, inter intracellular markers. But the other half of your team is very much more along the AI computational side of things. <clears throat> is that in your skill set or is that the team that you've built to address the questions that you want addressing? Yeah, yeah. So that's that's definitely more the team that I built. I would say it's some, I mean, everyone in my team is better at, at what they do than I am, right? I, I'm, I can... I'm not building the AI models. I'm not coding, but I can understand advantages and different disadvantages with different approaches and why to use this model and not this model and think about the potential of what we could do and kind of keep, keep track of the fields. So I'm, I'm still learning there, but uh, the actual coding, it, it's, it's not me. So how, I, I, I've been doing some interviews recently and you know, you, you know what skills you're looking for in a person and you know when you interview them, if they genuinely have those skills or not. If it's not one of your top skills, how do you know when you're recruiting this team that they are genuinely have those skills? Yeah, yeah. So, for example, for I mean, co coding is easy. You can do code reviews, right? You can ask someone else in the team to look at their code that they've written, and with GitHub, that's pretty easy to to do that. So, I usually I, I, I do trust my gut feeling a bit a lot when I recruit, but I'm also quite structured about the work because I know that it's it's easy to carry bias with you, right? And I often ask someone else in my team to also interview and, and come in with partic particularly probing areas where I feel like I'm not really sure that this person is a good fit either for the team or scientifically or 
So try to do it. I, I think there's a high risk if I'm the only one interviewing someone that it will be biased somehow. So I try to make use of other people. Oh. Can I ask this? Oh, I'm going to ask this question. Which team do you prefer, the wet lab team or the... <laughs> oh, no, you cannot ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> nice try, though. Uh, and that, then there's also, don't forget the important people that are kind of well-versed in both. They might not be the, the, like developing this new architecture. They might not do for the AI models, but they can train the AI models and they can still generate big data, data sets and analyze yeah. it. So there's also a very important, I would say, component of teams like that. That would be the kind of multilingual people that are right in between. Actually, yeah, my PhD student at the moment is a, it, it, a mathematician. Uh, we got her for the computation analysis side, but actually we got her doing the wet work uh, yeah. because I, I think no, understanding the provenance of the data and an understanding of what controls the data, what can go wrong, what can modify it is, is really important actually. Yeah, so, it, it's important to understand the limitations of the data if you want to build good, good models, right? And we're working a lot with both models to better, that's paper coming out this week uh, on a model for single cell. Uh, classification of patterns in single cells and then we're working a lot with synthetic image generation and and towards this goal of building this uh integrated cell human cell and of course we need people with training in biophysical restraints for example on on models and and that's not my area of expertise so but but trying to keep the big big picture there and then realizing also that everyone the wet lab people they know exactly what is artifacts what's not artifacts what is possible to ask what questions can i ask from this data set what can i not uh, evaluate in this data set because of limitations i think it's very important to you know make the teams talk to each other do, do you uh, do i i can see this is one way traffic which is possibly unfair uh, but do you get the computational team to do any microscopy at all even if it's just for a couple of days or a course on microscopy just to give them some sort of grounding or some fundamental understanding of it to start with yeah so far and uh, not everyone here at Stanford but, but the lab is not up and running yet but in Sweden I think everyone has done some microscopy yes and what we also force everyone to do in my team might not be the most fun thing to do but for every release of the cell atlas we have to curate the data ensemble will have come with a new update for example that might change things and it's not it's not super fun work but it gives us a great understanding of what we're doing and if we split that work on on everyone it's like a day or two <laughs> so things like that everyone in my lab will have to help out with as well so where, where do you see yourself going i don't know i'm i i i think definitely towards more computation um and maybe higher resolution as well or dynamic time lapse imaging so we, we have we're exploring different directions more hyperometric measurements more modeling in silico more mapping different data sets to a common common framework or a shape space or something like that so definitely in that direction and uh, the the whole integrated cell but beyond that i don't know yeah with this with the spatial omics side developing at a really furious pace, and I, I guess a new cosmic system out there, the Koya, the Cycler, the Maxima, the, oh gosh, I'm going to lose those are names who are not going to even try and name them all. That must be quite an exciting area for some of your applications yeah. as well, especially maybe going, going to the, the Koya type approach, the Liverpool type approach, the ship cytometry type approach, the cosmics type approach, where you get that subcellular information. Yeah, exactly. So we've been working quite a lot with some of these instruments. And I think what our questions are slightly different than the, the kind of early questions, which often has been like, where are the immune cells? How, what kind of niches do we find here with these immune cells? And, and that's interesting, but we're more interested in what's the different cellular states? What do the organelles look like in the different cells, for example, in a tissue context? So basically understanding cell, cell form, shape, and states in situ and um, building assays to do that. So I'm very interested. And it will also be very interesting with the in situ sequencing technologies with subcellular resolution to try to, because there's many open questions relating to if the RNA location also encodes somehow where the protein will be localized. So I think we'll learn a lot by being able to generate um, multi-omics data sets there as well. 
Yeah. It's definitely a fun field, and it, it's uh, and it's great that there's a critical mass now engaging in spatial omics. So I think that's really pushing the field forward. I, I'm, I'm hoping this is not the case. I don't think it will be the case. But do you feel as though that you're in competition with others, or do you feel as you just you're part of a bigger team internationally with everyone who's in this area? Yeah, I think for the subcellular protein mapping, maybe we're not in that high competition the multiplexed imaging surely you can see it as competition but i also think it's nice with a with a critical mass in a field it makes it easier to to publish it makes it easier there's better conferences because there's more people interested in the topic for example but of course i would love to see more people interested in in like protein multi-localization and actually not just saying that this cell has these genes expressed but also looking at where are the proteins and what's the different states so i think that like Understanding these dynamic states, I think we need to to target proteins to do that better and not RNAs. And I think there the field still has a bit to go, but it's coming. Okay. Right. So no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I, I think competition is good. Okay. Some quick fire questions then. Okay. PC or Mac? Well, I do have a Mac. I don't know. In theory, maybe PC, but I do have a Mac. Okay. Uh, McDonald's or Burger King? Oh, neither. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite place to eat out would be? Um, here in Stanford, I almost don't know yet, but we are ex enjoying all the, um, the Mexican food so far okay. because we don't have a lot of that in Sweden. Coffee or tea? Coffee. I'm a big coffee drinker. Espresso, Americano, filter um strong coffee the american coffee is very weak to me as a swede we drink a lot of coffee and we drink strong coffee so i would say strong black coffee with milk in it okay beer or wine depends on the weather <clears throat> and and the okay, setting red wine beer, is right? nice uh but a, a cold beer is great when it's warm out okay red wine or white wine red wine good job oh, and in california yeah, oh, I know the wines. <clears throat> Chocolate or cheese? Cheese. Early bird or night owl? Oh, I'm a night. Ni I'm a, a, a late bird, but with the time zone changes now, I'm up, up early every morning, and it's not really my element. But <laughs> I can do it. <laughs> Definitely okay. late bird. Okay, U.S. or Sweden? Oh no, Sweden is will always be my heart. But right now, I'm in the U.S., so uh, okay. I, I guess uh, soon they both places will fit in my heart computational team or wet lab team haha -ha, nice joking. try <laughs> i'm joking uh, they will keep asking me this you know <laughs> book, book or tv uh i think tv but books are good but i don't know i like pods also okay so yeah. what do you listen to then I, I, I listen to music and then sometimes I listen to different like Swedish chit chat pods. I've been listening to a pod about uh, the legal system in Sweden recently. Um, that's been very interesting. Okay. And what sort of book? It's good when you go to the gym to have something like that to listen to. Yeah. And, and you're not listening to the microscopist. You know, this is utterly wrong. You know, you should be listening to the microscopist then. I should. I should. I just discovered this morning that I could find it on Spotify. So I'll listen to it uh, on my daily dog walks. I promise. You'll There's lots, lots and lots of cool people in there talking. So I, it, I think it's, uh, I will definitely listen to it. You'll have to get a lab to tweet out which one you listen to. Uh, what's your job? When you, when you read a book, what is your job, favorite genre of book? Is it fictional, non-fictional? What sort of fiction, um, non-fiction? It's more, um, I would say it, it's fiction, but more on the, sorry, I'm lacking the English words to describe it. More on the, like, uh, life uh living life in different ways and that yeah. kind of emotional things but I, I i like books that are also thought provoking and, and different so i tend to to it depends a little bit and then i read a lot of just regular like thriller yeah. you know books like that because it's just completely you can disconnect your brain and you don't have to think much about it and my mom reads a, a lot of books like that so i get them after her <laughs> okay <laughs> You said you, you like to read books where you don't have to think too much and just light into it. So TV, what is your light entertainment on TV? I sometimes 
TV vice, what is the worst TV that you watch, but it's great to watch? Yeah, so, you know, it, TV, I think it's nice that, you know, when you watch a series and you can disconnect your brain. Recently, uh, we, we've had a hard time to find good series. So we recently re-watched all of Seinfeld, actually. <laughs> and that's kind of a nice uh, brain relaxation. <laughs> that's a few to catch up on if you're only just starting. Yeah, to... yeah. So we, we've, I think we've done over the past year, probably all of, all of it. What's your favourite film? And you're not allowed to say Avatar because you've got an Avatar. That's just not fair. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, oh, sorry, I can't. I can't think of one now. Sorry. Okay. Star Wars or Star Trek? What's your preference? Star Wars. Star Wars. Okay. I, I, you know, I'm going to have to do a tally to see how many said Star Wars, how many said Star Trek. It'd be quite interesting. Do you have a favorite Christmas film? Uh, I like Nightmare Before Christmas. <laughs> It's not really a Christmas it's film. But... And the... Yeah, 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 yeah. Jack, Jack Halloween, Halloween, Jack, Jack Halloween. Yeah, 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 exactly. It's not really a Christmas film. But otherwise, I watched a very nice Christmas um, series, a Norwegian Christmas series a couple of years back that I've actually rewatched this last Christmas as well. That was just so heartwarming and very aligned with how Christmas is celebrated there. Okay. And what about your favorite? What, what sort of music? You said you listen to music when you're doing stuff what sort of music do you like listening to i listen to a, a lot of different music i listen to for example first aid kit swedish a lot of swedish music i would say um i recently booked concert tickets to go see santa gold in, in san francisco later this year so it's it's a bit all over the place okay <clears throat> there's no harm in being all over the place with this and do you have any pet uh pet hates habits that people do or things that niggle you at home or at work <laughs> yes I do but now I can't think of them um yeah, I, don't I, say I definitely do but now I can't think of any it's a back out sorry okay do you have any bad habits yourself absolutely <laughs> um, <laughs> I always sing in the car, which my daughters hate when I'm when when I'm also driving their friends to swim practice and I I, I forget about it. So they're super embarrassed about that. That's, not uh, a, that's just being a parent. Yeah, that's just being a parent. That's true. Other bad habits. Well, I I, I tend to to eat a lot of uh, <laughs> sweets when the kids have gone to bed. That's maybe not the best habit. Um, I know they've just heard that if they listen to this they know you know you're going to have done it so exactly. they can't listen to this. no exactly so they, they're not they're not going to listen to the microscopist <laughs> <laughs> not to the older okay so moving back into work thank you for those uh your team I, I I've teed you a bit I hope we will get a better I I, I didn't resize the picture because this is obviously scaling up so this is your team I think it's quite nice to see your team <clears throat> how many PhDs how many postdocs Yes, it's a great team. Can you see? They're they're just lovely. They're happy, and nine of them are moving with me to Stanford, which is amazing. And I'm oh, so wow. grateful for that because that means that they will help me to build a lab, and the culture will come along. So it's about, I would say, equal parts, slightly more graduate students than than um, slightly more PhDs than postdocs. But then I also have several staff scientists that's been around for a long time. So it's a quite senior group from that perspective and I guess the the advantage of working in a big, big project with long-term funding like the Human Protein Atlas is that you can can have staff scientists in your team that work for a long time so so from that perspective it's a really great team so quite well balanced I would say with staff scientists postdocs PhD students technicians computational wet lab people to get nine going across is it, is a huge number it's because it's a big change for them obviously to, to be moving over uh, but you're right I think they will form a, a good network and hopefully they can also uh, integrate into the environment and not become a club exactly how, have you thought about how you're going to manage that with them to, to make sure they don't form their own lab yeah actually, and actually think... mix and socialize outside yeah. their own yeah that that's a very very good question and I I actually think it will sort itself out because as it turned out, the first person arrived in April, the next one in July, the next, or first in January, April, July. Now one is arriving today. I'm going to pick her up later today. And then we have one in December and then one in January. So they're all like coming with a couple of months in between. So I think that will definitely help that they will all have to 
um, form their own networks. And all of them are also coming here because they want to integrate with the environment here. So I'm sure they, they will do that. And the, the team that are left over there, how often do you plan to go back? The, they're not left over. They're, I, I just oh, want to no, say okay, that. Sorry, they're, yeah. they, they, are, they chose, chose to stay because it's a really great place to be. And it's also a very fun place in terms of spatial omics at the moment, giving yeah. the other technologies that are being developed at, at Silent Lab in Stockholm. So there, um, I will be there. I spent the summer in Sweden and I will spend, so I will spend summers in Sweden and then maybe one trip in the, I have one trip this fall, for example, and probably one in the spring, but I'm not sure. So something like that. But there, there is a lot of senior staff scientists left in Sweden and they're basically running it. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not, they think they need me, but they don't. <laughs> but, but as you said, with Zoom, and everything else now it, it's not like you're not there <laughs> no 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 it's it's i think we manage with with the covid also we've learned how to to manage remote work and it's of course frustrating to find the mutual meeting times i think but otherwise it can be a benefit also if you want to write a paper and it's kind of nice you can send it off and when you get back in the morning someone else has worked on it for nine hours and so, so sometimes it can also be a benefit and you can split, you can split, you can team teamwork in different ways. Yeah, I, I have a night owl postdoc. We used to have a night owl postdoc. And yeah, I could grant like during the day, drop it off with him at 10 o'clock at night. And yeah. at six o'clock in the morning, it was back on the desk with his additions. And you just carried on. It was very exactly. Yeah, and, and then the entire team is actually coming here for in, in last week of October. So the entire team is coming here. We're going to have a week full of just inspirational science and group meetings together with other groups at Stanford. And then the PhD students are staying a couple of weeks longer. Yep. Wow. I think I want to work in your lab. <laughs> if you want to come to do. We yes, are, come. <laughs> we, we are up to the hour and I still have questions I needed to ask you, but we are out of time because you you were involved in different courses and education as well. So I was talking to Florian recently talking about his in interactions with you and you're supporting different courses and events. The whole, especially for the data science side, that whole community and network, uh, which, which is, I would say, not very competitive with each other. I think they're really supportive with each other. I was going to ask you about that, but you know what? We might just have to do another podcast at some point yeah. and talk about but I, I can just agree and say that that image analysis community is amazing. If you're thinking about going into to that field, you know, for your PhD or anyone out there listening, it's a really nice collaborative field and it's really amazing to work in it. And everyone is building off of each other's solutions and not competing with each other. So it's a really great field. I, I, yeah, it, it's, I think maybe because it's a newer field that that isn't ingrained, that comp competitiveness is not so ingrained and the, the collaboration side rather than the competition side yeah. and I think maybe the acknowledgements are recognized differently and so people yeah. who contributed to the the, the the software the app which the, the, the code that's come out uh, so it's not all about getting the latest science publication and so forth no <laughs> and that's important discussions uh, about how to also build career tracks for the people that for the developers that might not have the scientific uh, aims in the same way so that's also for a different podcast but there's hopefully things will change in the field there as well so that we can also keep great developers in academia emma i think we'll be talking again soon i hope uh, <laughs> as we move into the future emma thank you so much for joining me today everyone who's watched or listened uh it is worth watching for some of the pictures but uh, i hope you've enjoyed it please don't forget other citizen science work such as lucy collinson and some of the other podcasts that are out there but Emma, I wish you all the luck with bringing your lab over, getting the two sides balanced and, and what, managing that split base uh, with big time differences. And I really look forward to the next developments. Uh, Emma, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. To view all audio and video recordings from this series, please visit bitesizebio.com forward slash the dash microscopists.